uh, hello everybody. Um, so as, as some of you know, uh, today's uh, speaker had to cancel uh, due to health uh, reasons. So today we have uh, once again, our very own Luis Felipe Rodriguez. Um, Luis Felipe obtained his bachelor's degree in physics from the Faculty of Sciences of UNAM and his PhD in astronomy from uh, Harvard University. Um, he is recognized as, as the initiator of radio astronomy in Mexico, and he was also one of the founders of our uh, Institute of Radio Astronomy and Astrophysics uh, back in the 90s. Some of his uh, research topics include um, the birth and early stages of stars, uh, galactic edge ray sources, Herbie, Herbie Carroll objects, protoplanetary disks, quasars, um, etc. And he has received uh, numerous awards, including the Robert Trumpler Prize from the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, the Bruno Rossi Prize from the American Astronomical Society, the Physics Prize from the World Academy of Sciences, uh, TUAS, the um, Premio Nacional de Ciencias y Artes, uh, the Premio Universidad Nacional, and he is also a foreign member of the National Academy of Sciences of the uh, United States. In, in 2010, he was made an emeritus researcher and became Dr. Honoris Causa by UNAM. And he's also a member of uh, El Colegio Nacional. Today, he will tell us about a different topic from last week, actually a topic that is very relevant uh, in cosmology, which is observations of atomic hydrogen at, at cosmic dawn. So uh, yeah, so, so uh, please, uh, Luis Felipe. Thank you, thank you very much, Vicente. Uh, indeed, uh, today I will be talking of a cosmological uh, uh, subject. You, you will ask, well, uh, I have very little experience and that's correct. But it turns out to be that in the bottom, this is a problem of star formation at, at, at high redshifts. And uh, star formation, we all of us know a lot. And it's just a matter of understanding how things were in the past and how to uh, you know, correct for the cosmological effects to understand what's going on. So let me, let, let me start with my presentation, which is uh, in this occasion, I will be speaking in, uh, in English, but, uh, but uh, the, 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 let me see, the, the presentation is, is in Spanish. I don't know if you can you can you see it, Vicente? Or? Yes, yes, look, looks good. Okay, okay. Here, it, here it goes. Well, uh, the topic is in these observations of atomic hydrogen in what the cosmologists call the cosmic dawn. One of the interesting things of cosmology is that uh, uh, cosmologists have uh, you know found and developed names for all these uh, stages that the universe went through. And uh, this plot we have seen thousands of times. And uh, the timing here runs from right to left. And uh, we all know that the universe started hot and ionized. And by, uh, by, Z, by a redshift of 1100, it recombined and it became mostly neutral. And uh, expansion continued. At, at the same time, at the uh, local level, there was contraction. And uh, by a Z of uh, 20 or 30, uh, star formation started. And uh, that's what is called the cosmic dawn, because the, supposedly from an epoch that was dark, you, you passed to an epoch that was illuminated by these new stars. These new stars, start ionizing um, the surrounding gas and uh, more stars are formed, galaxies start to assembly and you end, uh, as you go from uh, right to left, you end reionizing the universe and uh, slowly you move to a situation as the, as the one we have now that most of the baryonic mass is in galaxies and uh, the intergalactic medium is uh, very empty. So uh, I will be telling you about things that are supposed to have happened around this is a sea of 20, which was uh, where the cosmic dawn is defined 
in this graph Sorry, you see Luis Felipe, to interrupt you i don't know if i can interrupt you or you uh, you prefer that i ask at no the end. that's fine that's fine go ahead if you're going if you're talking about the cosmic dawn where the first stars are born you're talking about uh population three stars um, yes at the beginning it is population three stars this massive so along stars. your talk you're going to talk about this population of stars or is um only yes i will be i will be talking about that because they will allow the formation of pretty massive black holes. Uh, okay. Because you know the stars can be a hundred or hundreds okay. of solar of solar masses because of the lack of heavy elements. Yeah. So yes. So um, so what is interesting is that uh, you them they may ask what observational evidence do we have of things between a redshift of eleven hundred which we know very well because 1100 is where the cosmic microwave background was produced. And this is one of the best studied things in tremendous detail. But then what uh, in, uh, in English they call the dark ages, well, the, the hydrogen is neutral, there are no stars, and there is very little uh, observations in that in the region, let's say between a Z of 1100 and a Z of 20. Now, if you go in the other direction from our position to uh, you start going away, how far do we see things? Well, apparently at present, the most remote object known is this gal small galaxy that is called GN because it, it comes from the uh, Goods North census. And then it has this C11, which means that it has an 11 a, a redshift of 11, that's a lot, right? And apparently this galaxy was a study because it had a, a, Rama a, a, Rama, a gamma ray burst. And uh, uh, people can do this very well and find that this happened when the universe was only 400 million years. Uh, that is about 3% of its present age. Now, this galaxy, is it anomalous? No, it seems to be fine. It is a small galaxy, as you would expect uh, in that epoch. It has only 4% of the size of the Milky Way and about 1% of the mass. So this uh, small galaxy can be seen uh, across uh, very large distances. And I think that there is nothing detected directly above uh, a Z of 11. At a Z of seven, people have, have been detecting quasars recently with the new instrumentation. So, but let's say between 11 and 1100, there's very little evidence of anything because it, it, the, 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 this cold gas is so difficult to study. But I will be showing you a result that apparently changed this. Okay, well, we, we know that the, the universe is expanding. And if I can uh, measure the redshift or the recession velocity of an object, I could say how, uh, uh, at what moment in time formed, and we can say how much in the past the source is. And uh, this summary, well, it's a little uh, simplistic for you, but it is interesting over the years, uh, there have been these events that, as I said, the uh, cosmologists are baptized with great names. At, let's say at the time of zero, we have the Big Bang. Then at the, something like 370,000 years, the, uh, the universe gets cold enough to recombine matter and radiation decouple. And then the radiation just keeps traveling. And that's what we see to today as the cosmic microwave background which is so important. Then between this uh, epoch and uh, let's say about 200 million years, not much is observed now, but I will be showing you, as I said, this very interesting result that people is claiming to be seeing gas that is uh, uh, just uh, before the, when the stars uh, start forming. And that's what is called the cosmic dawn, another another great name, right? Now, if, if we keep going, as, uh, we're, after the universe had some uh, 9,200 9, million years, 
the solar system form. And now at present, we are uh, 13,800 million years after the Big Bang. Well, to, to really uh, work in, in cosmology, you have to understand hydrogen well, which is something that we do very well at the Institute. <laughs> hydrogen is just so important, right? We know it is the most abundant universe, uh, element in the universe. And in, in those epochs before the formation of stars, the universe was basically hydrogen and helium. And we know that there are two basic processes. One is that if uh, an electron or a photon collides with a neutral hydrogen atom, you get ionization, you separate the proton and the electron. And if uh, things are, the parameters are convenient, an electron can be trapped by a proton and you get the recombination. And what happened at 370,000 years is that the universe recombined. Well, it is, I guess, incorrect to call it a recombination because it had never been combined, right? It's the combination era because things uh, appear uh, ionized, right? But anyway, it's, it's called the recombination era. Well, and, and of course, this epoch is studied in detail. Several Nobel Prizes have been given to the study of this radiation that comes from that uh, back, that far back in the past. This is the famous uh, Planck satellite image of the cosmic microwave background. Uh, now, uh, uh, of, now, of course, uh, uh, I don't know, 50 years ago, Penzias and Wilson got the Nobel Prize for measuring the cosmic microwave background. But now uh, you can build a small receiver and detect the continuum. You don't, you don't need angular resolution because it's coming from all the sky. And you can actually build a very simple instrument and, and make an exercise and detect the cosmic microwave background. We will see that the, the uh, signal that I'm going to talk about it's also detected with a fairly small and simple radio telescope. Well, okay, but then you say, okay, after the recombination era, you have all this radiation from the, from the recombination, but people have, haven't found much between 370,000 years and 200 million years. Now, uh, what happens is that then the hydrogen is practically all neutral and both matter and radiation, uh, because of the expansion, are cooling. And, uh, and this epoch, uh, in, in English, there is a great uh, way of calling it, which is the Dark Ages. In, in Spanish, there is nothing equivalent. <clears throat> the Dark Ages for us are, are the Middle Ages, are not bad. It's just <laughs> in English, it is a bad, a bad uh, epoch. Well, anyway. In here, the important transition is the famous 21 centimeter transition. As you know, a hydrogen atom is the proton and the electron. And if the uh, spin of both the proton and the electron are aligned, this is a higher state energy than when the uh, electron flips and becomes inverted. And that uh, when, when the hydrogen does that, it radiates the famous line of 21 centimeters, whose frequency is known exactly as one of the numbers that is, has been measured better to, I don't know, 10 or 12 significant figures. In the other sense, if you have a hydrogen atom in the bottom state, it can absorb radiation at the right frequency and become excited. The, electron will flip and become parallel with the proton, with the proton spin. Okay. Well, here's again the famous figure and, and people started to think, hey, and here the time runs from the top to the bottom, sorry. Uh, you have the uh, cosmic microwave background and then there is hydrogen in between us and the cosmic background. So people started to think, can we see this neutral hydrogen in absorption against the cosmic background? 
And uh, a lot is known about, uh, about the early universe and people could have started doing theoretical calculations decades ago. The idea uh, was the following. Uh, in here, the key equation is this equation at the top that is the transfer equation at radio waves, but it, there is an equivalent uh, equation for any, any spectral window. And the idea here is that the line temperature, that is the signal, is going to be the difference of the so-called spin temperature of the 21 centimeter line. This measures how are the levels populated. Okay, the more you populate the top level, the higher the spin temperature, minus the uh, brightness temperature of the cosmic microwave background that now is 2.7 Kelvin, but you know, a C of 20 was 2.7 times 20 plus one. You have to correct for a C plus one uh, factor. And here is a, a term that we are not going to deal with it. It's just the optical depth of the transition. Now, if you look at this very simple equation, you know that if the spin temperature of the hydrogen is larger than the temp brightness temperature of the cosmic microwave background, you will see a line in emission. If the spin is less, you will see it in absorption. And something really interesting is that if the spin temperature and the cosmic background, uh, microwave background are equal, there is no signal because this is zero. So what happened with these temperatures as a function of time or of redshift? So th this is a, the key uh, picture I have and, and bear with me. In the horizontal axis, we have the redshift. Uh, this is, uh, we are at of course, a redshift of zero outside of the graph to the left. This is a redshift of 10. This is a redshift of 100. And here comes the interesting thing. The cosmic microwave background temperature decreases as one plus C. Now it's 2.7, but in the past it was 50 Kelvin, 200. Uh, at, the, at the recombination uh, era, it was 3000 or something like that Kelvin. In contrast, there is the gas temperature. This is the temperature determined by the microscopic motion of the particles. And this gas temperature drops as one plus C squared because it, it is uh, particle matters and there is this uh, adiabatic expansion. So here comes the interesting thing. So we have three temperatures to consider. The spin temperature, which is in red. And this is, as I said, is determined by the populations of the two levels. The gas temperature, which is just the microscopic motion of the, uh, of the particles. And then the cosmic microwave background temperature, which is the temperature of the uh, background. <clears throat> now, the cosmic the microwave background is the one that behaves perfect. I mean, it's just, it's just dropping in, in value as, as we go from the past to the present. And in this logarithmic scale, it appears as a straight line. Okay, great. At really high uh, red shifts, let's say 200 or 300, the gas temperature and the uh, temperature of the cosmic microwave background are coupled because the gas is neutral, but there are still enough electrons to couple these two temperatures. So in here, we have this situation the spin temperature and the cosmic microwave background temperature are equal and there is no, no signal. But then as the universe expands more and more, the uh, microwave background follows its very nicely defined uh, behavior, but the uh, gas temperature starts to drop faster. It starts to separate, uh, it becomes uh, colder than the microwave background. Now in this epoch, it starts form and it, it reheats, okay? Now, what happens with the spin temperature, which is the really important uh, parameter here? Well, the spin temperature 
as we go from the past to the present, at the beginning is coupled to the radiation. So there is no signal. Now uh, it is uh, at Z of 100 or so, it will be coupled to the gas temperature. So it gets cooler and hey, great in here, we expect absorption. Why? Because the spin temperature is less than the cosmic microwave background temperature. So we expect some sort of absorption as a C of 80 or 100. But then as uh, the universe evolves, in principle, the, uh, uh, the spin temperature tries to couple again with the radiation. And this is bad news, right? Because if, when it couples, you wouldn't expect the signal. Okay, but then like 70 years ago, two researchers uh, analyzed this in another context, you know, in those days, nobody was thinking in cosmology. And, uh, and these are W and F, two researchers. F is for field, W is for a researcher that has a very hard uh, a name, but that is very hard to pronounce. So anyway, they, what they showed is that as radiation from the first stars appeared, the spin temperature tries to couple again with the gas temperature. And this is the dash line in here. And these are good news because again, the spin temperature is less than the cosmic microwave background. And you expect another absorption like in here at 20 or so, 20 or 30. And then if you take this WF effect, then the spin temperature couples with the gas temperature and follows this curve. This curve. So in this region, you should see the uh, hydrogen in emission because T is bigger than T and B. But in here and in here, you should see it in absorption. And, and this was understood perfectly decades Sorry, ago. Sorry, Luis Felipe, yes. to interrupt you, but I think I missed what is, uh, what is the physics behind the WF effect? Okay, what happens is that you have, a, you, you, you start having ionizing radiation from this uh, population three stars, okay? Yeah, and, but, uh, yes. and in here is like a uh, higher, right? Like, mm, like 35, like Z35 or something. Isn't it like quite high Z? Oh, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the Lyman, it's the Lyman alpha coupling between the yes. uh, in, indirect coupling between the F equals one and zero by a Lyman alpha absorption and, and emission. Right, exactly. And a T e of 35? Well, no, here it's, it's more like 25 because this is 10, this is 20 and, and 25. These are calculations of like 2000, right? People has refined this and has pulled it a little more to 20, which is the interesting Z. But this is basically the idea that if you didn't have the WF effect that we'll just describe, you wouldn't have the absorption here you will only have a, a, an absorption here. So I was people... thinking more when I was saying the, the Z, when uh, when the the one without the effect, or the WF effect and with starts to, you know, uh, so you start to see the difference. That's why I was saying 35. Uh, oh, you, you mean, oh yeah, okay, you, yeah, you start, you start. And in principle, the models do start see a predicted absorption at pretty high seas. You, you will see now, let, let, me, let me show you. So here is the, the prediction. Let me, uh, let, let me look at, at this uh, plotting here, which unfortunately the redshift goes in the other direction, right? So like at the, at the redshift of 80, this is what was predicted, you know, 20 years ago, it's, it's pretty amazing. You, at the 80, you have a little absorption. This is the expected spectrum. And in here, it is as a, free, as a function of frequency. And in the top, it's as a function of redshift. Okay, so like at 80, you have some absorption. This comes from that initial decoupling of the uh, cosmic microwave background and the, uh, and the uh, kinetic and the gas temperature. Okay. The, uh, the two temperatures couple, couple, the two temperatures couple again, and uh, 
things uh, disappear. And then thanks to the WF effect, you get this other absorption. Okay, in here, they actually, uh, the, the peak is uh, of absorption is put at, at 20, but it starts working at like 30. And then it works uh, from let's say 30 to 18 or something. And then reionization begins. And once everything is reionized, you don't get a signal. So in practice, what happened is that people say, okay, what can we detect of this? This thing is weak and it's a very, very, very large redshift and it appears at a frequency of maybe 15 megahertz, which is terribly low. Um, actually, I think the atmosphere is optically thick to that, but maybe sometime people will do this from space. But this other absorption looks good. It, it appears as the redshift of around 20, and in frequency, that translates in something like 70 uh, something megahertz. Great. Um, what, what's the problem that has killed many of the groups that have started to do this? Of course, this is coming from a line that is in, the, in its rest frame at 1420 uh, megahertz, but it is reshifted a lot. It is reshifted into the megahertz. The problem is that this is the frequency here and the commercial FM radio goes from 88 to 180. So in here you have a tremendous commercial transmission and these transmitters are not perfectly built. Part of the energy spills outside the band and contaminates this region. And it is very hard to work here. People have to do these experiments to detect this absorption really in remote places. And I, I, I tell you some of these remote places. So people, you know, 20 years ago started saying, hey, let's build a receiver. You know, we don't need a big antenna. The signal is coming from all the sky. We need a small antenna. And what we, what we need is to find a quiet, radio quiet place, an amazingly radio quiet place. So there are, I don't know, maybe five or 10 groups doing this. This is one of the, of the arrays. This is located in New Mexico and it's called the Hydrogen Epoch of Reionization Array or HERA. And this is a set of uh, uh, mesh parabolas and it has been working. It hasn't reported any detection. How old is this array? Yes. How old is this array? This is started in 2008. Okay. They started a bit. People are, okay. Actually, Mexico has an array, not an array, has a detector. Now, I will show it now. Now, this is in New Mexico, which is a good place. It's very deserted, it's very isolated. Now, Mexico turns out to be has a detector, and this detector is located in a small island that is called the Isla Guadalupe outside of Baja California. It's 250 kilometers from the coast of Baja California. And, and it looks good. It's very isolated. There, I think there are 80 people living there or something like that. So the leader of this project, uh, many of us know Omar Lopez Cruz of Inaoi. And this is a picture of, of the detector. The detector is about the size of a table. You don't need more. It's called Sonda Cosmológica de las Islas para la Detección de Hidrógeno Neutro in Spanish. And, uh, and they, they also have been working easily for 10 years and they really haven't reported also results. And in one of the papers, they complain that even when they are pretty far from, from Baja California, they still get a lot of FM contamination. And the last thing I hear is that they were planning to move to another island that is even more far from the, from the, from the coast. But uh, it, it hasn't happened. I don't know what has happened, but there is no report. Well, of all these groups, one group has reported the detection. And this group is called the EDGES 
group. Now we're getting here, somebody uh, was thinking weeks on, of the name because of course edges means the border of something that they are, they are observing the edge of the universe. And the acronym means experiment to detect the global epoch of reionization signature. Where did they place this instrument? Well, in Western Australia, which is also very isolated. You can see in the picture here is a, a, a desert. The, the equipment is so big. Again, it's like a table, the size of a table. Behind this there is a group of really distinguished uh, researchers and experts in, in, in receivers. Uh, we, we, uh, uh, at least, uh, at least, uh, uh, Laurent Loanar and I know Alan Rogers, which is the second author of the paper. And this is very serious and very good people. So these guys in 2018 report the detection of an absorption signal at the expected frequencies. And here is the paper in Nature, and uh, the title is An Absorption Profile centered at 78 megahertz in the sky average spectrum. And, and these are the authors and these are really solid people. And here is the absorption in blue. Okay, this is the signal, right? You see it is a signal that has a, a depth of half a Kelvin. This scale is given in, in Kelvin. This is the frequency in megahertz. And the signal is sort of centered at, like at 77, as it's 78 megahertz. This is the edge signals. Oh, well, if I say great, what is the problem? The problem is that all models that were based on a standard cosmology cannot explain this uh, feature, at least by two reasons. One sorry, reason, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, so these models that you're showing here, uh, like you said, they show different cosmologies, but which is the parameter that is changing? Because it seems like a couple of uh, main groups, one that in 60 megahertz, you have like this going down and then going up, and then it gets like a, like, a, like flat, right? And then you have the other ones that start flat and they go down. Seems like there are a couple of models. So yes. what, what is the difference? This has to do with when you start star formation. And then the difference, that explains the difference in this direction. The difference in here has to do with the fact that these sources that you form will produce X-rays, young galaxies, black holes. And the, the more uh, X-rays you produce, the more you hit the gas, and the less the absorption signal is. So these models in here go from top to bottom is more and more X-rays. But the, the models in here are almost without X-rays. So this is the most favorable case. And still, they do not get uh, deep enough as the edges uh, signal. And it's like, thing, it's yes. amazingly different, I mean, is no? Oh yeah, right, that's why well, people- You is, need to go uh, down that temperature. Well, that's why people are so excited. Yeah. The other thing is that the, the signal is pretty narrow in Z, right? All these things, you know, star formation and stars and there is a, a star formation and there is absorption and they are very broad, but not deep. And the edges signal is narrow and, and deep. And they basically, in paper says that the absorption is too deep and it cannot be explained with models in, in the framework of standard cosmology. Now, of course, uh, what are the possible solutions? Well, the first solution is that the, the data is wrong and, and a lot of people think that this is the case. Now the group uh, sort of defends, as the, the group says that no, they, they know the receiver, they try different combinations and the data is right. So the, and the group is, is, is very good, so anyway. But that's the first possibility. The second possibility is that something anomal or some exotic physics cooled the gas lower than expected 
from just the expansion of the universe. L let me go. Let me go back to this figure. You can, okay, in here you see that the gas temperature, which is the green curve, starts uh, to decrease, but it follows uh, the, it follows this law, and and to really produce a deeper absorption in here, you will need the gas to be much colder. And what people have proposed is that, um, is that there, there are interactions between hydrogen and dark matter, which I, I really don't understand because they always tell you that dark matter doesn't uh, interact with bionic and, matter. And that is, that is breaking the standard model totally. Exactly. Totally. That's why is, you have Wait, to go I... beyond. Right, you have to go beyond the standard model. Well, uh, there are more papers on this explanation than the explanation that we are considering uh, as follows, which is as follows. Something, another explanation is that something adds to the cosmic microwave background radiation. And, and how that, will that work? Let me go back to the figure. What uh, we will doing here is that in this this difference in here determines the depth of the of the absorption. One way is to lower the gas temperature, which will pull the spin temperature. The other is to uh, pull up the uh, background radiation by adding another uh, uh, mechanism before the formation of the first stars. But okay. that doesn't go against the observations of the CMB? Well, well, the problem is this, the CMB is very well observed, but at higher frequencies, we know that it uh, adjusts the black body perfectly, right? But this is happening at 78 megahertz, a region where uh, they, they are no good data, and a region where the uh, cosmic signal is tremendously contaminated by emission from the galaxy, from our galaxy. And uh, so you, you, there are really no good measurements because you say, okay, then that means that if I look at the black body curve at very low frequencies, I should see an excess appear. It turns out to be that that cannot be measured in practice. So, so let's explore a little more this idea, which is what I, I did. This is the normal transfer equation. You have Ts, spin temperature, minus cosmic microwave background temperature. Now, if you were to add another mechanism that is called the cosmic radio background, um, this number will be bigger, right? And uh, you subtract it from this, and the absorption will be deeper. So this is what, I, what, what I'm trying to do. A colleague, Felix Mirabel, told me that he wrote a paper back in 2011 where, where he said that maybe uh, in this uh, first epoch in the cosmic dome, where you started forming stars, you were going to form very massive stars. And these stars were going to evolve probably very fast to black holes. And if they were in binary systems, you could have a binary system with a black hole accreting from the star. And we know that these are sources of radio emission. So he, he was very excited with the idea that a population of, uh, well, of uh, binaries uh, could produce the radio emission required by the model. Even you can uh, make a calculation so you can compute how many stars and black holes and, uh, and black hole binaries would you need to have this absorption? That of of course, that, that's, that's the way to go. Uh -huh. So, I, I that I guess. Right, right. And well, that's the that's the uh, the point of the talk. Ah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> so, so in here, what, what we ha what is happening? We have the cosmic microwave background, which happened at three hundred and seventy thousand years, and then we are here, many years later. And if there were nothing in the in the way, we will see a continuum spectrum with a slope, but let's say. Um, that you take out the slope and you get a flat spectrum. Now, this hydrogen at around uh, 
C of 20 or 30 seems to be good to produce an absorption. Now, if the HS signal is right, this absorption, the theoretical absorption is not deep enough. So what you do, or one way of uh, dealing with this, is that you put some sources behind the hydrogen to increase the absorption. So by adding a continuum, you, you get a deeper absorption. Well, we know how much radio emission these binary systems emit. We know in principle how to correct the, the emission. And you can indeed predict how many black holes you need if you have the, if you have the, uh, how much they emit in the uh, uh, frame of rest, right? So uh, this is what the uh, Phoenix was thinking was happening. It was that binary systems were forming and uh, the, the most massive star will evolve to a black hole accrete from the normal star. And then you produce radio jets, which are sources of radio emission, not very bright, I have to say. And indeed what happens is that we make, when we make the calculations, well, the sources are, the emission is not sufficient. That's, but let, let me uh, go a little more and explain you a couple of things more that are very interesting pedagogically. Something interesting that one learns is that we work mostly in the galaxy and we know that if we have the luminosity of an object, of a star, and we observe it he here, the flux that we're going to detect is simply the luminosity over four pi distance squared. This is the classical equation. In cosmology, and this is really interesting, the fact that the object is receding from us and the fact that the universe is expanding changes things and makes that the equation that you use to, to find the flux from the luminosity uses not the geometric distance, but something that is called the luminosity distance. And this luminosity distance is much bigger than the physical distance. Why? Well, one thing is that the emission is redshifted. It goes to lower energies. Two, since the object is receding, you get less photons per unit of time. Three, the universe is getting bigger. So the photons are diluting. So it turns out to be that this luminosity distance is just much bigger than the normal distance. And you have to do the calculations taking this into account and, and other things. So uh, the problem is that even if you are generous with the number of black holes you expect to form at cosmic dawns and with the radio emission, you fail by, by it depends on how you do it, but it could be as many as uh, 10 orders of magnitude to explain the absorption reported by edges. Um, so, so other groups, it's very interesting. Other groups have said that the radio sources can explain this, but uh, their papers are so complicated that it's very hard to say, what is the flux of these objects? How many of these objects are there? But when you do it, you find that they are exaggerating the emission by a lot. I mean, these sources that they are proposing doesn't exist in the present universe. Maybe they exist uh, in the past, but by, by many orders of magnitude, they exaggerate the, the flux density, for example, that these objects produce. They take black holes uh, of 200 solar masses and assume they are emitting like a black hole of 10 to the nine solar masses. So all this is, seems to be wrong. Uh, so we're back to square zero. Are, are the, is data wrong? Are the data wrong? Well, a lot of people is complaining of that. Uh, there is something that we don't understand for that remote epoch. And then there is this stuff of dark matter that a lot of, as I said, there are more papers exploring these exotic physics uh, uh, solutions, 
than looking into backgrounds and something more astronomical. And uh, the, the idea is that can somebody come with a radio source or radio sources bright enough to uh, explain for this for this uh, excess radiation that we need. Maybe it's simply that the excess doesn't exist, which a lot of people is favoring that. And simply what is happening is that the data are wrong. So the hope is that another group or groups will soon report their signal and, uh, and we will be able to understand if the, if the HS signal is confirmed, I guess it, it will be a Nobel Prize for some of the, of the guys in the group because it will really require uh, changes in our way of looking at, at this epoch of cosmic uh, dawn. So uh, thank you very much and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Okay, uh, thanks. That was a, a extremely interesting talk. Um, are there any, any questions? So um, I, I was I was wondering um, so about the, these edges, uh, the the instrument the edges. Um, you know, from the from the picture that you showed, uh, you, you could you could not really appreciate the size of the of the instrument. It, it looked like a table. Uh, so it's <laughs> it is it, the size of a table, or yeah. It is the size of a table. It, these are really small instruments, and uh, and it's it's a very good project. If you don't want to spend uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, the problem is dealing with interference and with other effects. As I said, at that low frequency, the galaxy emits tremendously uh, in synchrotron emission. So you, uh, you have to deal with the signal analysis and that is, uh, that is very hard. But the instrument itself, I don't know, I, 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 we should ask Omar how much it is. I don't think it is much. It is a very, it is a, a very small thing. Yeah, I guess that they, they should have made the picture, put somebody next to the picture, right? But these things are about the size of the table. Also, uh, Omar's instrument, right? It's just, uh, the, the, this other instrument here is a much bigger thing. They are all these uh, parabolas spread over the region. But uh, these instruments, they, they, they look at a big chunk of the sky, but that's okay. Um, the signal is coming from everywhere. Yes, and, and this is the, the edges uh, instrument. Yes, yeah, that's, that's what I was wondering. It does, does not look like a super expensive uh, instrument. So maybe- Right, maybe, maybe uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. I don't know how to raise my hand, but can you put me on the list? Oh, I don't know. Okay, sure, sure, uh, sure. Um, okay, so I see that uh, also Will, William, Will Henry has his hand up. Yes, uh, thank you, Luis. That was an extremely interesting talk. I was wondering about, is, is, is the LOFA uh, instrument able to observe this type of absorption line or does that not work at the right frequencies? It doesn't work at the right, uh, a frequency, but it works close. And they have been trying to measure the background, right? And, and mm -hmm. say, well, if they find that it's more than 2.7 Kelvin, that would be very interesting. But the problem they have is that if you just measure the background, you have the 2.7 Kelvin of the background, but then you have a little like a thousand Kelvin of the galaxy, and they are trying to subtract the galaxy. And there have been papers Sometimes you say, hey, we do see an excess. And then another group, no, no, there is no excess. If you do things right, you just have the, the 2.7 Kelvin. But mm -hmm. they don't work at the, at the frequency to get a, an absorption spectrum. Yeah, they yeah. Work higher frequencies. Yeah, well, I suppose it, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to, to see a line because you can make a differential exactly. measurement. Exactly. Where I was thinking, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And that has also been very criticized. Uh, with regards to the edges group, because the edges group actually sees a tremendous continuum, right? Which yeah, yeah. has a thousand K. And then there is this little thing in there and they have used very high order 
polynomials to subtract the continuum. Okay. And people are saying, well, if you use a very high order polynomial, you can fake a line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so thank you. There is a lot of literature. That paper has been uh, cited, I think, a thousand times or something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so, so Susana has a question as well. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Luis. Very nice talk. Uh, but I, want, I was wondering if the other groups, like the people in the VLA or Omar's group, have they analyzed their data? Should they have seen something like the edges signature? Well, that's a very good point, but they haven't uh, published anything. And they, they are not even criticizing, like they could say, hey, I have a signal that is much weaker, or I don't see your absorption, but this hasn't happened. And uh, I, I wonder what's, what's going on, right? Mm -hmm. Apparently the ages group was one that started very early and, and they, they are really very good people and, and they dare to come with something. But if you look at their signal, it has a lot of signal to noise. Right? Mm -hmm. It has a signal to noise like of 30 or something. So you really uh, couldn't question the reality of the, of the signal unless they did something wrong. But yeah, everybody's waiting for these other groups to say something, but, but nothing has happened. Would be interesting to ask Omar about. Yes, yes. Omar published a, a, a last paper in 2015 complaining of the FM interference and saying that they were going to move the equipment uh, deep, uh, deeper into the sea, I mean, to a much larger distance where they would expect not to see, not to get interfered. Okay, thank you. Okay, so next we have uh, Vero and then uh, Mauricio. Uh, again, sorry, Luis Felipe for interrupting you so much. One of the things, it was just a comment. I think that this detector is so small that they should put them should put them in Mars or something. I think would be like, a, I don't know, ideal uh, away from us. And the other thing is, uh, even if the signal is too, um, let's say for others or magnitude, I don't want to say wrong, but the first, uh, even with that, as they did before, you can build models with different cosmologies also, right? So you have like, a, there's a, how you say a scatter in the in the absorption that you would get also so it would be interesting to to see if this scatter would go orders of magnitude or not for example i was just thinking that just uh, thinking and also one thing that i think is very interesting is the uh, self interacting dark matter because now when people they are working on that they find uh, i mean when, when dark matter self interacts in these models, they have these huge signals. So maybe if we are talking about the universe at the beginning uh, and, and you have self interacting dark matter, each, these signals should be brutal, like, like really, really um, very energetic. So I, I was just thinking about that. And also, also not just with a, with a standard model and try to you know, to make a, a, paramet a study of parameters of the standard model, how, as I was saying, this scatter would, um, you know, would, would give you different models of the absorption, but also exactly with these other uh, alternative models. So how would that be the scalar field, the self-interacting, there's like many models and how low could you go? Even if, if you don't, I mean, it's, it's huge, like 10 orders of magnitude is insane. But even with that, how low could you go? And that would give an idea uh, of uh, maybe putting into the test a new alternative uh, dark matter model. So I think it's very interesting too. Correct. People have been doing this of uh, saying that dark matter by itself could produce a, a radio signal. Yes. And there are a number of papers. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that indeed all this has uh, you know, resurrected the idea of having radio telescopes in the dark side of the moon that never looks at the, at the earth. And, yeah. and I, I, it should be even not very expensive to do that. Uh, and maybe somebody 
I don't know. I, I always think about the moon like closer and a bit contaminated, but I think Mars is the, I don't know. I don't know. It's one to go. I don't know. But yes, of course. I mean, it would be fantastic to have one of these uh, detectors uh, far right. away. The, the, this think, is not ending here. People is yeah. going to do more things. Yeah, and also because so small. I mean, it's uh, so tempting just to go for it, no? Yeah, it, there's, there's again. Thank you. It was really interesting. Hmm. Uh, okay, thanks. And um, Mauricio? Uh, yes, uh, very interesting uh, talk, uh, Professor Luis Felipe. I was wondering if, if this population of black holes uh, proposed to, uh, to, to explain this absorption uh, will need to have a specific range of masses. I understand uh, for what you say that uh, will be because of the population tree, uh, uh, very massive stars, but uh, what about the primordial black holes or even intermediate mass uh, black holes? I know this is very speculative, but uh, if you need a range of masses to, 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 to produce this radio emission. Well, uh, yes, uh, I don't uh, recall people considering like, you know, like these black holes that Hawking predicted, perhaps because they are very low mass and even accreting, let's say, at the Eddington rate, they wouldn't produce much radio emission. And that's an, that's an interesting thing. I, I haven't seen, I haven't, I, I, among the many papers that I, I sort of uh, look at, I haven't seen uh, people worrying about the, uh, the primordial black holes. People have thought all sorts of things. For example, you have the cosmic uh, microwave background. And if you had a way of moving a little bit of energy from frequencies to the correct frequency, you could produce this. But again, people doesn't like this because they say, no, we measure the, uh, the spectrum of the uh, cosmic microwave background at, high, at all high frequencies and it's just a perfect black hole. So you cannot uh, move energy around. And, and people is, is uh, also saying that at recombination, also when the cosmic microwave background was produced, there were processes that produced more radio emission. But again, um, what is clear is that by C of 20, you already, have, you already are forming stars. And I, one of the things that I consider was H2 regions, why not? No? You have these uh, huge stars, which are inside uh, gas uh, halos. We produce H2 regions, and H2 regions are pretty good uh, continuum emitters, but it also doesn't work, it's just not enough. You, you need a lot of radiation. You, you have to compete, you have to produce a background that is about two times the cosmic microwave background. And that's a lot of energy. And so, so nobody has come with a convincing explanation. Thank you. Okay, so I see that Susanna still has, uh, you still have your hand raised? My mistake, I apologize. Okay, okay. okay. Well, in that case, if there are no more questions, uh, let's thank uh, Luis Felipe again uh, uh, for a great talk. Uh, so, so see you everybody next week. Um, I hope that the speaker next week does not cancel uh, for a change. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So, so see you then. Thanks everybody. Goodbye.